SBYI is a new way to squeeze income out of the S&P 500. It offers a higher yield than JEPI and so far has delivered a higher total return than JEPI or XYLD. Stay tuned for a review of the new addition to my top 10 high yield favorites. I got off on the wrong foot with this fund. It's called the S&P 500 High Income ETF, ticker symbol SPYI. When I tried to review it back in June of 2023, my research dug up so many concerns that I didn't get into the meat and potatoes of how it works. I liked the idea of the fund, but I couldn't consider buying it unless these concerns were addressed. Enter Garrett Paylor. He co-founded the company that created SPYI, NEOS. He agreed to come onto the channel, and frankly, I think he did a good job of handling my questions. No need to rehash everything here, but if you want to learn about how and why they distribute return of capital and their option trading strategies, check out the interview. In light of what he shared in that interview and the research I've done since that first video in June, today I will get into the meat and potatoes of how SBYI generates returns how it compares to its competitors, XYLD and JEPI, and frankly, why I bought it. A 12.03% yield is high, but it's in line with what the fund is trying to achieve. What I learned from the interview with Garrett is that they intend to keep the distributions fairly consistent. For most covered call funds, the distributions rise and fall with the volatility of the underlying asset, in this case, the S&P 500 index. This is why JEPI's distributions vary considerably. Same for other funds like TSLY. However, for SBYI, the fund managers will make adjustments to keep the distributions at around one to one and a half percent per month. Garrett mentioned two specific ways they do that. Firstly, they can increase or decrease the degree to which the options are written out of the money. For example, further out means less probability of the option being exercised, which means greater potential growth, but also less income. The second tactic they could deploy is to adjust the percentage of the portfolio that they write options on. Higher percentage means more income, less potential growth. So the result of all this is that these slight tweaks will create variations in potential growth in order to achieve more consistent income. My assumption is that they've adopted this strategy because their target clients value consistent income over consistent growth. And that's why the distribution chart looks so uniform, with each month coming in at just a fraction under 50 cents. A quick disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor. Since retiring in 2017, I began researching my investments in way more depth because, well, now they pay for everything. When I find something interesting, I make a video. SBYI is one of three ETFs operated by a fairly new fund management company called NEOS. The active trading is overseen by two portfolio managers, Garrett, who I mentioned earlier, and Troy Cates. They both have a background in option-based funds and left a larger firm, Harvest Volatility Management, to create NEOS, which is actually an acronym. So I expect if you look at the acronym, any future funds they create will be options based because it's right there in the name. I noted in the June video that their online profile showed the old firm and NEOS at the same time. Looked a bit odd. Turned out this was a temporary transition and they're now 100% focused on NEOS. So how does SBYI make 10 to 12% when the S&P 500 pays less than 2%. The answer is selling covered call options, similar to XYLD and JEPI, but there are some important differences that we'll cover shortly. Selling covered calls means they generate income by selling the rights to the portfolio's upside above a certain price. This is why the price of SBYI doesn't keep up with the S&P 500 price. SBYI holds the individual stocks from the S&P 500, but instead of selling calls on those individual stocks, they sell them on the S&P 500 index. The reason they do that is for better tax treatment, which we'll get to shortly. The SBYI portfolio managers sell covered calls approximately 1% to 4% out of the money, which means that if the options are executed, there's room for 1% to 4% appreciation during the option period, which is roughly a month. The covered calls are sold on 75 to 90% of the portfolio. The other 10 to 25% is free to rise or fall with the market. All covered call funds underperform in a rapidly rising market because they're selling some of their upside. But those two factors I just mentioned give SPYI more potential upside than XYLD. Why? Because XYLD sells calls on 100% of the portfolio, 
at the money, not out of the money. If we look at total returns over the past year, the two funds have swapped leads. So it's too soon to say which one has superior performance. I think SBYI will gradually pull ahead over the long term because it offers more potential appreciation. Just my opinion, not financial advice. These charts and a lot of my research come from Seeking Alpha. The analysis articles go into way more detail than I can share in a 12 minute video. There's a link in the description for a free trial and any other promotions that they're currently offering. They change from time to time. Some people will compare SPYI to Jeppy because they both hold stocks from the S&P 500, but they're actually fairly different. Jeppy holds far fewer stocks and they're selected based on criteria that lead to lower volatility. Importantly, Jeppy has far less exposure to the Magnificent 7 tech stocks as explained in this video. Also, Jeppy's covered call income comes from equity link notes and they offer less visibility than the simple covered call strategy used by most covered call funds, including SBYI. There's one other element to SBYI's option strategy that I overemphasized in the June video. Their prospectus gives them the flexibility to use call spreads. That means that in addition to selling calls to generate revenue, they can buy calls to boost potential appreciation. The success or otherwise of that strategy is really yet to be determined, but there are two reasons why this isn't something that I'm any longer focused on. First of all, they only intend to use it when market conditions are favorable. And in the first year of operation, well, that just hasn't happened. Secondly, the amount of money spent buying these far out of the money options is so small, it just doesn't even move the needle. The expense ratio is 0.68%. Jeppy is far cheaper at 0.35%, but that's run by JP Morgan and has 30 billion with a B under management. So don't worry about JP Morgan, they're making plenty of money. For context, SBYI has just over 320 million under management, a much smaller operation. Then there's XYLD. Unlike the other two, it's not actively managed, it just follows a formula. And at 0.6%, they're charging almost the same as SPYI, despite 2.9 billion under management. Let's move on to the most misunderstood aspect of SPYI, return of capital. A lot of people found this confusing, including me. The majority of SPYI distributions to date have been return of capital. That should make you question what's going on. Obviously, if they were actually returning the principal back to the investors, that would be bad. The reality is that there are two types of return of capital. The intuitive one that's most commonly found in some closed end funds when they're short on cash. It's destructive to the value of the fund and it's not sustainable over the long term. The one that's not so intuitive, but utilized by ETF fund managers like Eaton Vance, Global X, and now NEOS, is return of capital as a tax treatment. Same phrase, different outcome. In this second case, SBYI isn't returning the investor's principal, they're distributing a combination of dividends from the stocks in the portfolio and income from selling covered calls. The income from the covered calls is the biggest chunk of the distribution. That income was generated from selling options against an index, the S&P 500, which entitles it to be classified as a 1256 contract. The result is that some of the distribution will be classified as return of capital. The return of capital portion won't be subject to income tax, but it will lower the investor's cost basis on the fund and eventually be subject to capital gains at 60% long term, 40% short term. If you find this confusing, you're not alone. I've spent hours Googling this stuff. NEOS is putting together their official explanation that will appear on their website in the coming months. If you're unsure about all this, probably best to consult your tax advisor and you can send them the 8937 tax form from the NEOS website so they know what they're looking at. I'll link it in the description too. Apart from the yield, here's what I like about SPYI. These covered call index funds produce most of their returns from the distributions, but we can't ignore the long-term price trend because one day we might wanna sell. A good example of what I'm trying to avoid is XYLD. It's been around for long enough to see a long-term trend. The 10-year total return of 78% isn't really that great. And part of the problem is that over the 10-year period, the price of XYLD has actually fallen 5.5%. SBYI offers more potential for price appreciation than XYLD for the reasons mentioned earlier. The SBY options are sold out of the money instead of at the money, 
and on less than 100% of the portfolio, leaving some of the stocks room to grow. Tax is different for everybody, but in general, SBYI offers a high level of tax efficiency. The return of capital defers your tax liability and is taxed as capital gain rather than ordinary income, which is usually beneficial. XYLD also pays a portion of their distribution as return of capital, so a similar benefit. Jeppy's distributions are treated as ordinary income, not as tax efficient for most Americans. SBYI also provides tax loss harvesting, which means offsetting gains with losses. That may provide tax savings for some investors, but it's harder to estimate the future benefit. Here are the concerns I have about SBYI. Obviously, one year isn't enough time to assess how SBYI will perform during all market conditions in particular, its ability to recover from a crash. That's not a criticism of the fund, there's just no substitute for real-world data. My second concern applies to all covered call funds. Even though I believe that SPYI will suffer less asset erosion than XYLD, I don't expect a lot of price appreciation. That's because, just like every other covered call fund, it's 100% exposed to the downside of the underlying S&P 500 index, while the upside is capped. This means that after a correction, it won't just bounce back like the S&P 500. It's a much slower recovery. Unless time proves otherwise, I'm going to assume low growth. My portfolio income needs to grow to stay ahead of inflation. So as a retiree, two choices. One, spend only a portion of the SBYI distributions and reinvest the rest. Choice number two is to hold some stocks or funds that grow their income so that the portfolio income also experiences some growth. For that purpose, I hold stocks like Arbor Realty Trust. My take on SPYI is that it's the best tool I've found to extract income from the S&P 500. For the reasons I've explained, I think it will take market share from XYLD, and as you've probably guessed, I don't hold any XYLD. As for Jeppy, there's some correlation with SPYI, but if we look at total returns over the past year, the performance lead switched back and forth between the two funds. Jeppy is less affected by the ups and downs of the Magnificent Seven tech stocks. I like the Magnificent Seven and I want exposure to them, but I don't want my portfolio dominated by them. For that reason, I continue to hold Jeppy, and since the interview with Garrett, I've also initiated a position in SBYI at 5% of my portfolio, which is currently my cap for any one investment. I wouldn't normally allocate 5% to a fund that's only a year old. However, the structure is pretty low risk. It holds the S&P 500 stocks. That's far more diversified than any REIT, BDC, or sector fund. It uses a fairly conventional covered call strategy, which I consider to be low risk. So the downside is potential underperformance of the S&P 500. If the S&P 500 volatility, as measured by the VIX, remains low, I expect the potential underperformance to be small. And if the volatility spikes, then the gap between the two could widen a bit. But I consider these risks as moderate and an acceptable price to pay for the steady 12-ish percent income. Before I go, I mostly make videos about investments I like, but I like some more than others. If you want to find videos of my favorites, I made a playlist to save you time. It's called Top 10 High Yield Favorites, and SBYI is the newest edition. That wraps it up for SBYI. More Armchair Income, coming soon.